Day 187 of the war in Gaza, and while most Israeli troops have been withdrawn from the enclave, the IDF is continuing heavy military pressure. Tanks are patrolling along the border, and airstrikes are being called in whenever and wherever Hamas operatives emerge. This, as Prime Minister Netanyahu says yet again, that a Rafah operation is circled in the calendar. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. Israeli forces have stepped up bombardments on Deir el-Balakh in central Gaza, as well as Rafah, two areas the IDF has yet to enter in ground operations. The targeting of Hamas is ongoing, with tanks deployed along the border amid frequent airstrikes when called in as Hamas operatives emerge. Speaking to new IDF recruits, Prime Minister Netanyahu stated once again that the IDF will eliminate remaining Hamas brigades, regardless of what the rest of the world says. Netanyahu made the statement a day after saying that a date has been set for an Israeli operation in Rafa without disclosing the date. Meanwhile, Israel is facilitating the ever-increasing amount of international aid entering Gaza in record amounts. 468 humanitarian aid trucks were inspected and transferred to Gaza. This was the highest number of aid trucks that entered Gaza in one day since the start of the war. Despite Israeli efforts, aid organizations say that trucks are coming in, but distribution remains a major problem. And when you put up statistics with numbers of trucks going in, saying, look at all these hundreds of trucks going in, and you put it against, look how few trucks have actually moved around with, the dis with distribution. <laughs> well, it's kind of an own goal, isn't it? Because half of the convoys that we were trying to send to the north with food were denied by the very same Israeli authority. And looking back to October 17th, when an explosion took place in the parking lot of Al Ahli Hospital, resulting in hundreds of casualties. Israel was widely blamed, even though evidence proved damages were caused by a misfired terrorist rocket. An Islamic Jihad member has now admitted how they and Hamas manipulate the media to turn their lies into international headlines. <laughs> The lies of the terrorists believed by much of the world. And U.S. President Joe Biden is urging Israel to call for a six- to eight-week ceasefire in the war in Gaza. The White House insisted the comment did not mark a major shift in policy. But in his, in his appeal to Israel, Biden did not mention Hamas or the potential deal for the release of the Israeli hostages. More on this from ILTV's William Sharon. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. I've spoken with everyone from the Saudis to the Jordanians to the Egyptians. They're prepared to move in. They're prepared to move this food in. And I think there's, there, there, there's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. The White House insisted the comment made before last week's call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu did not mark a major shift in policy. Washington also announced that the meeting will take place in the coming weeks between Israeli and U.S. officials to discuss the planned IDF operation in the Gaza city of Rafah. 
The announcement seemed designed to push back at Prime Minister Netanyahu's announcement that Israel has already planned a date for the Rafah operation. No, we do not have a, a date for any Rafah operation, at least one that's been communicated to us by the Israelis. On the contrary, what we have is an ongoing conversation with Israel about um, any Rafah operation. Um, the president's been very clear about our concerns, our deep concerns, uh, about Israel's ability to move civilians out of, har out of harm's way. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan praised Israel's willingness to let more aid into Gaza, but said it is not good enough. If you look at the last two days, there has been a substantial increase in the amount of aid going into Gaza. That's good. It is not good enough. We would like to see more action following through on what the prime minister has announced publicly, and we'd like to see that over the course of the next few days. And joining us now with more on the U.S. stance on the Gaza war and Washington's relations with Jerusalem is Arya Lightstone, former advisor to U.S. ambassador to Israel and one of the leading architects behind the Abram Accords. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So U.S. President Biden really taking the gloves off here. I mean, publicly criticizing Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, this is a new low uh, in U.S.-Israel relations, isn't it? I don't think it's the lowest of the lows, but certainly it is a very challenging place. It's even more challenging in knowing that the war is not over. And there's a possibility of a inflamed war in the north with Iran openly and overtly threatening Israel. At this point in time, I don't know if it's the lowest low, but it's certainly the greatest abandonment of Israel by its chief ally, the United States of America. And it seems that the closer Israel gets uh, to an operation in Rafah, the louder and harsher uh, the Biden administration opposition. What do you make of this? And do you think Biden would really change U.S. policy when it comes to Israel? Well, I think the clear part is that there was this protester in Dearborn, Michigan, who was screaming death to America, death to Israel, and explaining that America is the most corrupt, horrific country in the world. Uh, the press secretary for President Biden was asked to condemn those comments, and she did not. This is the voter that President Biden is conducting his foreign policy based upon, and it should terrify every American. And, you know, from the Israeli side, will Netanyahu truly risk losing a U.S. support uh, and enter Rafah to eliminate Hamas? Uh, there are over 130 hostages. Unfortunately, many of them are not likely alive any longer. And residents of the South who won't return to their homes if Hamas is still in charge of Gaza Prime Minister Netanyahu is primarily responsible to his own citizens uh, after that becomes their position of the allies. In this particular case, I don't think there's a lot of gray area. Prime Minister Netanyahu or Benny Gantz or Eisenkot or any member of the Israeli war cabinet is on the moral and ethical right. And the United States of America, led by Joe Biden, here is uh, ferumphering on an issue that should be pretty clear cut. And, you know, you mentioned the hostages, and there is a deal on the table now. Uh, but yet, in looking back, right, every time a deal has been on the table, the U.S. publicly exerts pressure on Israel, you know, first with abstaining from the U.N. vote, and now uh, Biden's interview calling for a ceasefire with no mention of the hostages. I mean, what do you make of this? If you were Hamas, why would you negotiate? The United States of America is doing it on your behalf. And when you don't realize that that is what is happening, or maybe they do realize that that is what is happening, how in the world are we going to get a ceasefire? I would like to make a comment. The whole theme of bring them home uh, implies that this is on the Israeli government to be able to bring them home. Uh, the concept should be let my people go. The pressure needs to be on Hamas to deliver them. The Israeli government has said yes countless times. Hamas continues to say no. And the Western world is putting pressure on Israel. It, it, it's a perverse moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so looking at the Biden administration uh, overall, you know, since the start of the war, relations uh, have been quite lofty, sometimes showing signs of support and then sometimes the opposite. You know, why do you think the Biden administration is acting so, you know, hot and cold and what is Israel's best course of action, you know, to preserve these relations? Here's the advantage. Every Israeli loves America, and the vast majority of Americans love Israel. There's right now a political challenge in America where President Biden is not looking at the polling of Americans. 
He's looking at the polling of a small subset in a state called Michigan and possibly also in Minnesota. And he's making a determination based upon 150 to 250,000 potential voters that he lost anyways based upon the electric vehicle mandates. They just don't realize that. And they're conducting foreign policy based upon trying to win a small sliver of American voters. The U.S.-Israel relationship is strong. The basis is there. The foundation is there. And it will withstand this horrific leadership. The question is, will other people who see this leadership going sideways call it out? I'd like to give special credit to Senator Fetterman and Congressman Torres for consistently doing that from the Democratic side. I can't tell you how many times Republicans were challenged everywhere they went. Do you accept or deny what President Trump did on issue A, B, or C? I don't know how Democrats can walk anywhere in the United States of America and not be asked politely, but not be asked, do you stand on the side of Hamas or do you stand on the side of Israel? All right, Arya Lightstone, thank you so much for your analysis today. Thank you. Have a great day. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And hostage negotiations are ongoing in Cairo as mediators push the U.S. proposed plan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that the ball is in Hamas's court as the White House is desperately trying to reach a deal. ILTV's Devo Klein has the report. In the latest round of hostage negotiations, U.S. officials are pressuring both Israel and Qatar as the White House expressed much eagerness to come to a deal. We have an offer that's on the table now to Hamas that is very serious and um, should be accepted. Um, Hamas could move forward with this immediately and get a ceasefire that would benefit people throughout Gaza, as well as, of course, get the hostages home. The newest conditions proposed by CIA Chief William Burns would see a six-week ceasefire, the release of 900 Palestinian security prisoners convicted of murdering Israelis, and most importantly, an IDF withdrawal from the corridor between the northern and southern parts of the Gaza Strip, thus allowing Palestinians to return to the north. In exchange, Hamas would release 40 hostages. Yet Hamas has already clarified that they cannot comply to the release of 40 living hostages in the humanitarian categories because there are simply not enough. These criteria were approved by Israel on the condition that Israel can veto the release of certain prisoners and have the ability to release them internationally, preventing them from returning to Gaza and the West Bank. Hamas has noted that the deal does not fulfill any of Hamas's wishes, but is set to give a final answer soon. Israeli officials are speculating the Hamas will not accept due to the full withdrawal of IDF troops this week, a move that officials believe to have hurt negotiations, as Hamas would not compromise when so much was given to it for free. Washington has stated that the U.S. believes Israel is ready for a ceasefire and that it's time for Hamas to step up and go forward with this round of negotiations to see hostages released and a pause in fighting. We continue to work very closely with Israel, with Egypt, with uh, Qatar, uh, on getting an agreement that will result in an immediate ceasefire and the release of hostages and also create even better conditions for surging assistance to those who need it uh, in Gaza. And freed hostage Nili Malgalit revealed in an interview with French publication Le Point the harrowing details of October 7th as she shared horrific details regarding the nature of her kidnapping. According to Malgalit, she was kidnapped by Gazan civilians and then trafficked to Hamas. All of the details in the following report. As part of a large European tour to raise awareness of the Israelis' Romanian captivity, Malgalit opened up about her experience being trafficked to Hamas after her capture. The former hostage recounted how she was woken up on October 7th to multiple messages that terrorists had infiltrated her kibbutz. Shortly after, Gazan civilians carrying Kalashnikov rifles that had entered the kibbutz 
set fire to Margulit's home and dragged her from her safe room. Margulit was then driven in a car to Khan Yunus, where her captors met with Hamas terrorists. She recounted how massive crowds of civilians cheered and her kidnappers were ecstatic. After arriving in Khan Yunus, negotiations with Hamas terrorists began for her price. After the payment was made, Hamas brutally took hold of Margulit and was immediately transferred to a tunnel with 10 other hostages. Many male hostages were heavily wounded after being dragged on motorcycle back and using her medical experience, Margulit described how she tried helping the other hostages, some of which were also taken from Niroz. Margulit said that they had leaned on each other psychologically, describing the mental games that the Hamas captors would use. Nili Margulit, 41 years old from Niroz, is just one of the voices speaking up about her experience in Hamas captivity, further stressing the urgent need to free the remaining hostages as soon as possible. With Gazan civilians. Uh, and moving on, a trade war was declared between Turkey and Israel. Jerusalem said it would impose measures to curb imports of products from Turkey in response to Ankara putting restrictions on exports of a wide range of products to Israel until a ceasefire is declared in Gaza. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. The Turkish Trade Ministry started the boycott, announcing measures against Israel would apply to the export of products from 54 different categories, including iron, marble, steel, cement, aluminum, brick, fertilizers, construction equipment, aviation fuel, and more. Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımız tarafından olaylanan bu tedbirler gecikmeksizin adım adım hayata geçirilecektir. Bu tedbirler ilgili kurumlarımız tarafından kamuoyumuzla paylaşılacaktır. İsrail ateşkes ilan edene kadar ve insani yardımların Gazze'ye kesintisiz biçimde ulaşmasına izin verene kadar bu tedbirlerimiz devam edecektir. An Israeli spokesman referred to Foreign Minister Israel Katz saying that Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan was again sacrificing the economic interests of the people of Turkey in order to support Hamas and Israel will respond in kind. We've made it quite clear that Israel will not give in to violence and extortion and we will not condone the one-sided violation of the trade agreements and we will take parallel measures against Turkey which will harm the Turkish economy. Now, the foreign minister said that he's ordered the preparation of another list of products that Israel will, uh, for Israel to prevent Turkey from exporting. Israel said it will also seek to stop U.S. investments in Turkey. And in addition, the foreign minister has instructed the uh, Israeli foreign ministry officials to contact countries and organizations uh, in the United States to stop investments in Turkey and to prevent the import of products from Turkey and to our friends in the American Congress to examine the violation of the boycott laws and impose sanctions on Turkey accordingly. Shortly after the Israel-Hamas war started, Turkey and Israel withdrew their ambassadors while regularly trading accusations. This was the first significant measure taken by Ankara against Israel since the start of the conflict. And joining us now with more on Israel-Turkish relations is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, specializing in Turkish foreign policy, Dr. Galia Lindenstrauss. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So it's no secret that Turkey uh, under Erdogan has been very hostile to Israel, but instigating a trade war, I mean, why now? And what does Turkey stand to gain from this? Yes, you're very correct that till now it was mostly harsh rhetoric against Israel and no concrete action. Now we see something that is very significant uh, because for the first time, uh, basically, Turkey uses economic measures against Israel. Um, I think the explanation to this is mostly domestic pressure inside Turkey. We've seen protests in Turkey calling for Turkey to halt the trade with Israel. We saw the political parties, opposition political parties, use this issue against Erdogan and his ruling party. Uh, we saw this in the local elections in the end of March, in which the ruling party uh, basically uh, only arrived second and the opposition party arrived first in terms of the national uh, votes. Um, so this is basically having a political cost for Erdogan, the fact that he was only doing rhetoric. And uh, now we see that he's responding to these pressures. 
And yet, you know, Erdogan has in the past few months publicly expressed uh, support for Hamas, but then recently said or reports indicated that he was actually looking to try and improve relations with Israel. So, you know, what's your analysis of these reports? I think the reports that Turkey wanted to improve relations with Israel were exaggerated. Um, but uh, I think Turkey does not want to cut ties with Israel altogether, at least now. Uh, we are talking about economic measures against Israel, but Turkey does understand that it has to have a relationship with Israel in order to have political influence in the Middle East. You cannot ignore Israel. You have to have some communication channels with it. And I think this is still the position in Ankara, and it's still not cutting the ties altogether. And we can't forget the fact that Turkey uh, is a NATO ally. And yet, you know, under Erdogan, Turkey is re-embracing uh, radical Islam. You know, in this war, we see Turkey standing with Hamas, listed as a terrorist organization by many NATO allies, and also aligning itself with countries like Russia and Iran. You know, so this begs the question, where is Turkey's relationship with the West heading? I think that actually the fact that Turkey put these economic measures against Israel is due to partly to feeling confident that its relations with the U.S. is now in a better position. Uh, Erdogan is invited to the Washington to the White House next month uh, because basically Turkey now agreed to having Sweden and Finland join uh, NATO. And if the relations with uh, the U.S. were more rocky, I think Turkey would have been more hesitant uh, to do these economic measures against Israel. So actually it's, it's a sign of confidence on the Turkish side that uh, Washington is with it. Interesting. And, and, you know, what impact will this trade war really have on Turkey and on Israel? So Turkey said the restrictions will be in place until there will be a ceasefire in Gaza. And as we know, as part of the discussions on the hostages release deal, uh, there is a discussion of the ceasefire. So maybe a ceasefire is going to happen. And uh, maybe this restrictions and uh, economic uh, warfare is only temporary. If not, uh, then uh, this will affect uh, the Israeli economy. Uh, Israel imports a lot of uh, different things from Turkey. Most of the restrictions are regarding the construction uh, sector. So this will probably cause uh, the higher uh, construction costs in Israel. And this will, of course, affect the cost of living in Israel. And on the flip side, will it have any meaningful effect on Turkey as well? So uh, in terms of the bilateral trade, Three quarters is Turkish exports to Israel, and only one quarter is Israel exports to Turkey. So clearly, Turkey has what to lose. However, uh, Turkey is a big economy; it can afford to lose this. And Israel and Turkey, you know, once shared very close relations. Today, we're at a low point. I mean, looking at the direction Turkey is headed in, do you foresee any chance at reconciliation between the two countries in the near future? Um, there was a lot, really a lot of mistrust uh, between Israel and Turkey in general and between Netanyahu and Erdogan particularly. They did meet in September, first time face to face, uh, and it did look like a new start. But now the war has pushed uh, relations backward, very much backward. I think the issue of mistrust is here to stay. And if anybody, for an example, foresaw the building of a gas pipeline from Israel to Turkey, I think this is now off the, off the table. Off the table. A shame. Dr. Galia Linden-Strauss, thank you so much for your analysis today. Thank you. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Rain showers are expected around most of the country tonight with lows of around 13 degrees Celsius or 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, we'll get a break from the rain with only cloudy skies and highs of about 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Ladar Gravelazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.